Hi, everyone. I'm Wendy Murphy. I'm an attorney in Boston, Massachusetts, where I specialize in impact litigation on behalf of women's and children's civil rights and constitutional rights. And I want to talk to you about what happened when the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, because I don't think the mainstream media is actually telling you the whole truth about how devastating the decision was. First and foremost, um, let's talk about where abortion rights were before the Dobbs decision came down on June 24th, earlier this year. Um, you know, we got the Supreme Court to create, explicitly create constitutional rights with regard to abortion for women back in 1973. And that decision was very important because it said that the rights of a human being, a woman, to decide what to do with her body, whether to have a child or not, are fundamental human rights. They exist in the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. They exist as a penumbral rights matter. I mean, this is what the court said in Roe versus Wade, that, it, that it's such a fundamental right, it doesn't exist in just one part of the Constitution. It's kind of covered in a variety of places. And Roe versus Wade was important in that sense that it gave women a constitutional seat, if you will, at the table of abortion rights. And then of course, we know that Roe versus Wade pitted that right that women have against the state's interest in, in protecting the unborn. So in a sense, we had this scale, this balancing test in place from 1973 on. And the balancing test, um, you know, a lot of people objected to it. Why should a fully born existing woman have to balance her rights against a non-person, a not yet born, you know, clump of cells, frankly. Um, obviously there's more to an unborn fetus as the cells develop further in, in, during gestation. But the point is there were people who said women are already in existence, their rights shouldn't be balanced against anything else. Uh, and, and, that, and that did not win. I mean, we got Roe versus Wade, which, which gave some weight on the scale to the state's interest in the unborn and some weight to women. Well, flash ahead to 1992, the Supreme Court decided another case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, in which they weakened the weight of women on that scale. Women, women still had a seat at the table, but they had weaker rights. And the court changed the language around what kind of rights they actually had. Instead of calling it a penumbral interest with um, some rights from the Fourth Amendment, some from the 14th Amendment, and, you know, it was a kind of a mixture of rights that gave women this right to privacy around abortion, the court said something different in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. They said, this isn't so much about privacy and a penumbral interest. It's really about the 14th Amendment's due process clause. This is the notion that under the 14th Amendment, the right to due process means the government has to be fair to you. Uh, it can't be unfair. It can't be shockingly unfair. It has to be um, respectful of the fact that you are a human being with rights as an individual. And built into that notion of due process is the most fundamental right of all that the Supreme Court recognized long before uh, 1992. Um, and it's called the right to be let alone. The right to be let alone, which was described by Justice Brandeis in the 1800s as so fundamental to human freedom, that we don't even have to codify it and put it in the Constitution. And there was a danger that if you did put it in the Constitution, that the courts would then construe it as being less than uh, fundamental. You know, you, you could have some courts maybe chip away at it or interpret it in a way that was inconsistent with the robust nature of this as a fundamental human right, the right to be let alone, the right not to have the government decide what you do with your own body. You get to decide what you do with your body. That's a fundamental notion essential to civilized democracy. And the Supreme Court has recognized that right over and over and over again, even though it's not explicitly in the Constitution as the right to be let alone, it is considered the most important aspect of due process, which is explicitly in the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, which was adopted in 1868. Here's the problem. So we get that, you know, baked into our system of rights, if you will, in the Casey case uh, in 1992, even though it was a bit of a reduction of rights from Roe versus Wade, it was still considered a really fundamental, important right 
for women, this ability to decide for ourselves what to do with our bodies. And yes, it was a right that would be balanced against the state's interest in the unborn. Um, but let's kick back to that 1868 creation of due process for a minute to understand where women's rights have been even before 1992, before the Casey case. The 1868 adoption of the 14th Amendment that gave due process rights to persons didn't give those rights to women. Women were excluded. Yes, the word persons technically includes women, you would think, but the Supreme Court said right after the 14th Amendment was adopted, women aren't persons. <laughs> they don't exist as persons with rights. And that was because at that time, uh, women were believed to exist primarily in the private sphere of home and family. They were, uh, in a sense, owned or controlled by their husbands and their fathers. And to the extent they had rights at all, they were derivative of husbands and fathers. Women were covered by the rights of their husbands and fathers. That's where the doctrine of coverture comes from, that women didn't need their own rights because they were covered by men. Well, uh, let's just say women didn't take kindly to be excluded to being excluded from the 14th Amendment. Um, and the 14th Amendment, by the way, also gave voting rights. Very few people talk about this part of the 14th Amendment, but it also gave voting rights to white men, uh, which <laughs> equally rubbed women the wrong way. The 15th Amendment came along a couple of years later and gave voting rights to black men. But after that time period, uh, women had nothing, no voting rights and no equal protection rights and no due process rights. Let me explain about the equal protection clause for a second, because that also matters with regard to abortion rights. In the 1868 14th Amendment, again, that really important guarantee of due process that was put in there was side by side with the equally important guarantee of equal protection of the laws. So this basically means that if you have equal protection of the laws, then all laws have to be applied equally and enforced equally on your behalf, period. Like the government cannot treat you differently and worse when enforcing any laws, whether you're getting a dog license or uh, you know, arguing that you're, you're um, being uh, subjected to un undue force by the police, or you know, having even something like the 13th Amendment, which prohibits slavery, when you go to court and say, my 13th Amendment rights are being violated, if you don't have equal protection of the laws, the 13th Amendment doesn't apply equally to you. So the most important thing I can tell you about the 14th Amendment is that it didn't apply to women with regard to either the due process clause, whereas, which is where we get that fundamental fairness notion, um, and, and it didn't apply to equal protection of the laws. So after 1868, women could be treated as slaves, they could be um, subject to unequal treatment in the courts because they had no rights under the 14th Amendment. It was kind of up to the states whether the states wanted to treat women as equal persons. And many did, but they weren't required to because there, was no, there were no roots in the federal constitution that required the states to treat women equally or for that matter, fairly under the due process clause. So flash ahead, we've got you know, this, this doctrine in 1992 that grants women abortion rights, now it's clarified that this is a due process right, a right to autonomy, personal bodily autonomy under that concept of the right to be let alone. That's what women got with clarity in 1992 in Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So although women's rights were weakened compared to Roe versus Wade in terms of the weight they had on the scale, compared to the state's interest in the unborn, we did have this really solid seat at the due process table, if you will, after uh, 1992. And then <laughs> flash ahead to 2022, do we get this Supreme Court decision from a case that started in Mississippi where the Mississippi um, law that was, at, that was in controversy would have weakened our rights under Planned Parenthood versus Casey by lowering the age uh, of fetal development at which women's rights would disappear in this balance. Under Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that moment in time was viability. 
under the law that was challenged in the Dobbs case in 2022, it was not viability, but pre-viability, 15 weeks of gestation. So at 15 weeks, women's rights would basically disappear and the state's interest would prevail. Well, a lot of people thought the Supreme Court would, would support the Mississippi decision and say, you know, we started with Roe versus Wade, things got weaker in Casey, now we're gonna weaken them a little bit more. But no one, I shouldn't say no one, I did not think the court would go so far as to completely take women off the scale. But that's what they did. They said, not only are women's rights weaker now than they were in 1992 in Casey, we're just taking them out completely of the constitution. There is nothing for women. Not only are their their rights not just weaker, they're gone. They have nothing, nothing. What that means is that when women become pregnant, they no longer exist as persons. Because remember where the roots of this decision come from. They date back to the 1868 adoption of, of the 14th Amendment when personhood rights were given with regard to due process and equal protection. And the Supreme Court said, sorry, you know, they don't protect pregnant women. Now, this erasure of pregnant women, this notion that you can, as the Supreme Court of the United States, literally declare that women, when they become pregnant, no longer exist under the 14th Amendment is sort of the same as the Supreme Court saying, it is now legal to enslave women. Because that's what you get when you don't have personhood. When you're not a person under the 14th Amendment due process clause, you are effectively subject to enslavement because the only people, the, the, the way the law forbids slavery is, is that, uh, that persons can't be enslaved. So if you're no longer a person under the due process clause, The fact that the 13th Amendment prohibits slavery of persons, you know, you're nowhere. You don't exist. You can't even assert rights under the 13th Amendment because you've lost your personhood under the 14th Amendment. The 13th and 14th Amendments are inextricably intertwined when it comes to how you protect your rights. You can have a right guaranteed to you under the 13th Amendment, but if you don't have the the roots of the 14th Amendment to ensure equal enforcement of the 13th Amendment, then you really don't have 13th Amendment rights at all, especially when the Supreme Court says that once you become pregnant, you're not a person under the Due Process Clause. Equally important is the lack of full equal protection rights for women, because again, If you do go to court and say, I feel enslaved now because I no longer have personhood when I become pregnant, if that's what, if that's what, uh, you know, the Supreme Court believes, then if I go to court to argue that I am now enslaved as a pregnant woman under the 13th Amendment, which is unconstitutional, the court can say back to me, um, yes, you are technically being enslaved by laws that require you to give birth, laws that force you to, uh, you know, give up your authority to decide what happens to your body. Uh, You know, that is really the same as saying the state can enslave you. And because you can't argue that it's an unfair act of the government because we're no longer protected under the 14th Amendment, you also can't argue that it is a violation of your equal protection rights. Why? Because women lost their equal protection rights a long time ago too. The Supreme Court of the United States, when deciding that women were not persons under the 14th Amendment, basically said that that the laws, all the laws can be applied unequally to women, including abortion laws, including abortion laws. So flash ahead now, here we are. Uh, Women are no longer persons once they become pregnant under the 14th Amendment. Uh, cannot make claims that they are now enslaved. In other words, they can, let me be clear, they can claim that they've been enslaved and they would be correct, but they can't do anything about it. Because if you go to court to complain that you're being enslaved now under the 13th Amendment, if you challenge the Dobbs decision saying it enslaves you under the 13th Amendment, 
the court can say, but under the 14th Amendment, women don't have equal protection of the laws, so I'm not required to apply the 13th Amendment equally to you. This is where we are in this country now. It's not just about abortion. In fact, I would argue that abortion is kind of uh, a bit of a, a, of a distraction to what's actually going on, which is that this is a, a kind of proxy discussion about the fact that women don't have basic equal rights at all under the constitution. And by the way, uh, it's the fact that women have never had basic constitutional equality under the 14th amendment that enabled the Supreme Court of the United States to treat them as non-persons. You can't treat fully equal people as non-persons, but you can treat women. You can treat women as non-persons because they've never had that full equal protection of the laws that other people got in the 14th Amendment in 1868. Now, to be clear, when women were declared non-persons in 1868, uh, you know, we start fighting back right away. We we did we were declared not uh, entitled to voting rights in the thirteenth and fourth in the fourteenth and fifteenth amendments, and we were declared not persons uh, for equal protection and due process rights under the fourteenth amendment. So we we said we're going to just go get our own amendments. If if the Supreme Court can declare that we're not part of the Constitution, we're going to put ourselves in explicitly, uh, and this is important, right? Because because if we're not in there, the only way to get us in there is to have our own amendments. So we right away started fighting for the right to vote, which uh, we finally won in 1920 when a suffrage, the 19th Amendment, the Suffrage Amendment was adopted. And right away, we filed the Equal Rights Amendment to fix the 14th Amendment, to put us in and give us equal protection and full due process rights. Well, the Equal Rights Amendment, when it was first filed with Congress in 1923, went nowhere. There was no appetite on either side of the political aisle to give women equal rights. Uh, it did not pass Congress, in fact, until 1972. And in 1972, when the Equal Rights Amendment was finally passed by Congress, it couldn't become part of the Constitution until it was ratified by three-fourths of the states. So it was sent to the states for ratification in 1972. And we got 22 states very quickly in the first year to ratify, and we were on the fast track to ratification until Roe versus Wade came down. I mean, this is something to think about. Uh, the, the, the issue of abortion kind of got propped up as a distraction in 1973 and the Supreme Court gave women abortion rights in Roe versus Wade to derail the Equal Rights Amendment. And that's exactly what happened. The uh, Roe versus Wade decision was followed by another case called Frontero versus Richardson just a couple months later. And those two decisions together seemed to give women all the equal rights they needed that the 14th Amendment had denied had denied to us many years earlier. So then now when women went to the states to demand that they ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, because we needed to reach 38 states in order to ratify, and Congress gave us only seven years to do that, we got, uh, again, we got 22 states very quickly. But as soon as the Roe versus Wade decision and the Frontero versus Richardson decision were decided in 1973, the ERA got derailed. The ERA got derailed for two reasons. One, the states could now say to women, well, you don't need the ERA. You got everything you need from the Supreme Court in the Roe decision and the Frontero decision. But it was also true that because Roe was created as this brand new doctrine of law, uh, a lot of women's energy and resources started to go toward abortion. Uh, money and resources and time and energy that we should have been spending on the Equal Rights Amendment, all of a sudden it had to be um, so, you know, sidetracked, if you will, to this fight about what Roe meant, because as soon as Roe was decided, people started uh, fighting in the courts about what it meant. And the, and the courts, as you know, especially um, states that were against abortion, they filed lawsuits, they passed laws right away to say, you know, here's, here's how we want to restrict Roe versus Wade. So women had to spend enormous resources fighting about what Roe versus Wade meant right after it was decided in 1973, and that took resources away from our struggle for basic equality. Now, why this matters is because if we had just stayed focused on basic equality, that would have fixed the abortion problem, right? Because you can only mistreat women if they are second-class citizens. If you create equality in the Constitution first, all laws, all rights 
have to be have to be enforced equally on women's behalf, including abortion. But because we got sidetracked, we started prioritizing the problem of abortion, the issue of abortion, um, against the importance of and the importance of prioritizing full equality in a much more basic sense, but sort of fix, let's fix the 14th amendment for women and that will apply to all laws, all rights, all issues. Instead, we started focusing on this sub issue of abortion and the sub issue of abortion um, undermined our ability to, per, to, to persuade the states to support the equal rights amendment. And so the equal rights amendment failed by the time the seven year, and it was later extended to 10 years, by the time the equal rights amendments ratification deadline expired, we only made it to 35 states. And you know, to me, that seems like the predictable, strate predictable result of a strategy that um, was caused, uh, that, that was established to de uh, defeat the equal rights amendment by propping up abortion as a distraction. And not that abortion is important, but why did it get propped up in 1973, just in time to undermine our fight for basic equality? So where are we on the ERA today then? Because how does the ERA relate now to the Dobbs decision? Well, here's the thing that very, no mainstream media are talking about this. When the Dobbs decision came down, Justice Alito, who wrote the majority opinion, said one of the reasons we are removing abortion from the constitution as a protected right. One of the reasons we're taking women who become pregnant out of the 14th amendment as non-persons, one of the reasons we're enslaving women now once they become pregnant is that the constitution doesn't have any of this in it, textually speaking. There's nothing in the text of the constitution that protects women's rights, that protects abortion. And because of the complete lack of women's existence, in the Constitution, Justice Alito had the foundation he needed to be able to say, therefore, we must rule that abortion is not a constitutional right. Because when we look back in the history of the Constitution, women aren't there. And he's right. He's not wrong. He's right. So what can we do then about the fact that the absence of women in the Constitution, uh, in some ways, forms the basis for what happened in the Dobbs decision. Um, aside from the fact that I disagree with Alito on every aspect of his ruling, um, the reality is we're, we have this decision now. And aside from you know, a few academics, very few people are saying what we really need to be saying, which is that when, when women are taken out of the constitution, the remedy is to put them in. When, when the Supreme Court rules that women should be removed from the 14th Amendment, then our remedy is to put them back in. Well, how do you fix the Constitution? How do you put women in the Constitution when they're not in there? The Equal Rights Amendment. But I told you, it expired. The deadline expired. By 1982, when time ran out, we had only reached 35 states. We needed 38. So how can we now put the ERA back in or put the ERA in the constitution and in a sense, restore Roe, put women back in? The Supreme Court put us in, in 1973 with regard to abortion. Now they've taken us out. So how do we put ourselves back in the Equal Rights Amendment? Well, but the deadline expired. Well, here's the thing. So the deadline expired in 1982 and a lot of women gave up and said, there's nothing we can do. You know, the deadline expired, we have to start over. We're exhausted. We don't wanna work on the ERA anymore. Not everybody agreed with that, but some women's groups did feel like they should just give up and um, start working on other kinds of women's rights issue at the state level and, and to some extent at, at, at Congress. But in 1992, something very interesting happened the 27th Amendment was adopted. That's our most recent amendment. The 27th Amendment, which pertains to congressional pay raises, what became part of our constitution in 1992, and women were furious because, remember I told you we got 10 years to ratify the ERA, seven and then a three-year extension. So we were given 10 years to get the states to agree that women should have equality in the constitution the 27th Amendment got 203 years to ratify. 
It passed Congress in 1789 and was allowed to become part of the Constitution 203 years later. The last state ratified in 1992, and a lot of people said it's too late. In fact, the Supreme Court had ruled in 1921 that it was far too late in 1921 to ratify the 27th Amendment. It was too old. But people didn't care. They just accepted and endorsed and adopted the 27th Amendment. So women said, uh, you can't let one amendment get 203 years and tell women they only got 10. We're going to fight back. We're not going to give up. We're not going to start over. We're going to fight back for three more states. And then once we get those three more states and we reach it, we reach 38, we're going to end up fighting in court and we're going to go to court and say, the deadline doesn't matter because just like it didn't matter, there's no deadline on the 27th Amendment. How can you put a deadline on something more important than congressional pay raises, human equality for half the population? It was our plan to get the three more states to ratify. And then we would have to argue in court that the ERA was valid because the 27th Amendment was valid, among other arguments. And there are many other arguments. Well, things got a lot better in 2012 because in 2012, the United States archivist, whose job it is to put new amendments in the Constitution once they become ratified, in fact, he's mandated under 1 U.S. Code Section 106B that the law is very explicit. When the last necessary state ratifies, the archivist must publish it in the Constitution, physically put it in there. No discretion, mandatory, absolutely no excuses. It must get put, it must go in the Constitution. And the archivist, are basically our nation's librarian, has to put it in there. Doesn't matter what anyone else says, it has to go in. Well, the archivist wrote a letter in 2012 saying, if women get three more states to ratify, I'll put it in the Constitution because I have to. The law says I have to, so I will. That's what his letter said. And he knew about the deadline. I and mean, he was asked, like, what are you going to do if we get three more states to ratify, considering that the deadline expired? Are you going to put the ERA in the Constitution? And he said, yes, I will. I absolutely will. It's my job. I have to do it. I have no discretion not to put it in. So women start fighting for the ERA Last three states, right? We're gonna get three more states and we're gonna have equality. We got Nevada to ratify in 2017. We got Illinois to ratify in 2018. And we finally got the last state, Virginia, in January of 2020. And of course, we looked to the archivist, when are you gonna put it in? And he said, I'm not putting it in. He reneged on his promise, violated the law, very clearly violated the law, and said that he uh, couldn't publish it in the Constitution because under the then Trump administration, uh, the Department of Justice under Bill Barr, his Office of Legal Counsel wrote, a, wrote an opinion letter saying the Equal Rights Amendment can't be published because the deadline expired many years ago. Now, here's the thing. The Attorney General of the United States, the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice can have any opinion they want, but they don't have the power to tell the archivist not to publish. That if, if anybody has the power, that's a, it's a court. A court didn't tell the archivist not to publish. Just the attorney general did, just the uh, Office of Legal Counsel did. And so um, he got sued. I filed the first lawsuit against him in Massachusetts federal court, basically telling him, well, you have to order this guy to put it in the, in the constitution, put the ERA in the constitution because he's mandated. He has no discretion not to, this is blatantly illegal. And the ERA is valid because the deadline is not valid. And that was what our lawsuit said. After I filed my lawsuit, the last three states to ratify filed their own lawsuit in DC federal court. We both made the same arguments. The archivist has to publish and the ERA is valid because the deadline is not valid. Well, um, both of us had our cases dismissed on the grounds that neither of us had standing. I was kind of, uh, let's just say, shocked that my judge, who was an Obama nominee, a, a, you know, a liberal judge on my court in Massachusetts federal court, said women don't have standing. I sued on behalf of women as a class in Massachusetts. The states sued on behalf of states' rights in the DC case. In my case, I said, of course women have standing. <laughs> this is the most important women's rights issue in the history of mankind. Like, of course we have standing to complain when the United States archivist is violating the law and not doing his job. And uh, the court said, no, we didn't have standing. And I, I argued, you know, if, if women don't have standing, who the hell has standing? 
standing basically means that you have been injured, legally speaking, you've been injured by some act of the government and that, that that injury gives you a right to sue. And I said, this is not only injury to women, it's catastrophic injury to women. We're being denied the most basic of human rights illegally by this government official who's refusing to do his job. This is injury on steroids. Um, and the states, unfortunately, when the states filed their case, they did not assert any kind of claim under the 10th Amendment, which would have given them the rights to standing, the right to sue. Um, so I think that their case actually wasn't filed in good faith, which is a story for another day. But suffice it to say, we both had our cases dismissed on standing grounds. Um, and um, as a result, I have been working with other lawyers to file new lawsuits. And there are several new lawsuits that have recently been filed to not only establish the Equal Rights Amendment as valid, but also to uh, reboot the Constitution. Because if we can get the ERA in the Constitution, we can then challenge the Dobbs decision by saying it was decided under a different Constitution when women weren't in there, as Alito said. Right, so let's put them in there, and then we can challenge Dobbs by saying, now that the Equal Rights Amendment is in there, we get to redo Dobbs. We get to say back to Alito, you're wrong that women and their rights aren't in the Constitution. They're there. They are the 28th Amendment. And so your Dobbs decision gets erased. We get to overturn the Dobbs decision by recreating the Constitution, making the Constitution better, putting women in there. Uh, rebooting it. It's really the best concept. I mean, but conceptually to explain this idea, like rebooting the constitution is the only way to quote unquote appeal or challenge a Supreme Court decision that's based on the constitution. You have to change the constitution to get a redo on Dobbs. So these three lawsuits were filed in Michigan, New York, and Rhode Island. They're all still, they're all pending right now. And we could absolutely use your help because these cases give us a chance for the, for the vo give us the opportunity to have the people's voices heard. Remember, 90 some odd percent of the American people support the Equal Rights Amendment. And now we, and yet we have a Supreme Court that decided women aren't even persons once they become pregnant. When there's that much of a disconnect and discord between the, what the people want and what the Supreme Court has said, you have to fight back in the courts. You have to get the, the courts in the states to kind of rise up for women, right? Get this, these little states that are much less powerful, you would think, than the Supreme Court of the United States. These little states now have a chance to fight back against Dobbs, to, uh, in a sense, um, overturn Dobbs by finding that the ERA is valid. And in a tiny little state like Rhode Island has an opportunity. The judge can, in that case, say, I find that the ERA is valid, which completely erases the foundation of the Dobbs decision. And then we get this rising up of the people through these court decisions um, and, you know, battle back against this authoritarian anti-democratic Supreme Court that thinks, <laughs> that thinks it can issue decisions that go against over 90% of the people's will. So these lawsuits are critically important and you can certainly help us and I'll explain why in a moment. But what I also wanna be clear about is that um, there's something even more basic that people can help with. So the lawsuits are important and we do need your help with that. But another thing that matters is, remember I said that in January of 2020, the last state ratified and uh, under Bill Barr that letter was written by the Office of Legal Counsel telling the archivists don't publish because the ERA deadline expired. Well, there was a lot of criticism of President Trump at that time, that he was hostile to women, that you know he's the chief executive of the executive branch. The archivist is a subordinate executive branch official. Trump could have just called him up and told him, to do his job and put the ERA in the constitution and tell him the Department of Justice doesn't have any power over you. Do your job, put the ERA in the constitution, but he didn't. So women were encouraged to vote for Biden. Remember in 2020, that was the presidential campaign. Biden was running against Trump and uh, there were a lot of women's groups were saying, don't vote for Trump, vote for Biden because Biden supports the ERA. In fact, he had said publicly at a debate that he was the 
strongest advocate for the ERA. Uh, Kamala Harris said she supported the ERA. So women were encouraged to vote for Biden Harris because we knew Trump was blocking the ERA. And now we wanted a chance to put someone in who would unblock the ERA. Sounds simple, right? Not so fast. Biden gets in, takes office, and does absolutely nothing for the ERA. In fact, he continued to block it exactly the same way President Trump had. Women were furious and they were flummoxed. Like, wait, you can't do this bait and switch thing with us where you promise you support the ERA and then you get into office and you continue to block it the way Trump did. We were told not to vote for Trump because he's blocking the ERA. So we voted for you and then you got into office and you continued blocking it the same way Trump did. So why did we vote for you? This is how women felt. And they were furious. We were furious. So here's the thing. Biden is still blocking the ERA. In 2022, he's still blocking the ERA. And yet he's asking women to vote for Democrats in November when the midterms come up because the Democrats care about abortion rights. Well, you know, oh, the abortion issue is on the docket in, in November, it's on the ballot. No, no, it isn't. We will not be sidetracked again by abortion getting propped up as the women's issue. It's a subordinate women's issue. It's a subcategory of women's rights. The far more important issue of women's equality is on the ballot in November. The Equal Rights Amendment is on the ballot in November. Women want baseline constitutional equality because it will give them equal protection of all laws and all rights, including abortion. We need to get equality established because it will protect all of our rights. We need not to focus on abortion because even if somehow magically we end up with abortion rights, Women are still going to be second-class citizens without basic equality under the Constitution. This is not complicated. Equality first, everything else will follow. Equality first, everything else second. Why? Because if you don't have those roots of equality in the Constitution, equal protection of the laws baked into the Constitution, then all the other rights you think you have as a woman really don't exist for you, not equally. They can all be enforced and applied unequally. You have to have those promised, guaranteed, unassailable, unmitigated guarantees of full equality, full due process of law in the Constitution. And the Equal Rights Amendment gets that for us. But Joe Biden is blocking it. I told you about the lawsuits. Here's the other thing you can do. Between now and November, the Democrats are very worried about losing Congress completely. And I'm not gonna vote for a Republican either. They don't support the ERA. But who do I vote for when both parties oppose women's equality? And the Democrats are obviously offering nothing in terms of fixing this Dobbs nightmare, the, the enslavement of pregnant women, um, to me is you know the most horrendous development in women's rights in the history of this country. And the Democrats are offering a whole lot of nothing. They're just saying vote for Democrats and we'll have a, We'll have a Congress that can uh, codify Roe. You can't codify Roe. <laughs> That's just not doable. Congress doesn't have the authority to pass a law overriding the Supreme Court. They, they don't have the ability to do that in a constitutional sense, right? The way to fix a constitutional decision is to fix the Constitution. Congress can't just codify Roe. Congress can only pass laws when it has the authority to pass laws. It has to be able to cite where is it getting its power from? So Congress gets power from the spending clause, from the commerce clause, from the taxing clause, from, uh, from the 14th Amendment, right? Congress can regulate things when it can cite to a constitutional uh, source of authority for its actions. They don't have constitutional authority to regulate abortion because abortion is not an interstate commerce issue. It's not a spending clause issue. It's not a taxation clause issue. And obviously it's not a 14th Amendment issue because the Supreme Court just said women aren't in there, pregnant women aren't in the 14th Amendment anymore. So don't believe this nonsense about vote for Democrats, vote blue will fix Congress and Congress will codify Roe. They cannot codify Roe. They can pass laws affecting the funding of abortion, but they cannot codify Roe. Nor, nor by the way, can they issue a national injunction 
forbidding abortions in all states. They don't have the power. They don't have the power. And everyone who's saying that Congress is somehow going to fix Roe or make, make Dobbs worse is lying. There's absolutely no authority to do that. But what we could do is pester Joe Biden to publish the ERA, pester him to put it in the Constitution. It's a phone call away. Joe Biden could pick up the phone, call the archivist, who at the moment is a woman, call the archivist and say, do your damn job. You're mandated to publish amendments in the Constitution when, the, when 38 states ratify. 38 states have ratified the ERA. Put it in the Constitution. Do your job. Maybe the courts will, will fight about whether that means it's valid, but it doesn't matter. We need it in there. We need it in there because it's politically more difficult for someone to take it out. Right now, it's super simple to put it in. Joe Biden can pick up the phone and call the archivist and say, do your damn job. Trump blocked the ERA and, and, and you know, Biden should say, I'm not Trump. Trump blocked the ERA, the ERA. I'm gonna unblock it. He could say that and he's not saying that. In fact, he said, women vote for me because Trump is blocking the ERA and I am gonna support the ERA. And then he blocked it the same way Trump did. So we have leverage now, we have power, we have an opportunity between now and November Women from, from the Republican side, from the Democrat side, from the independent side, from the unaligned side, from the Green Party, from the non-party, women of all stripes and types and all parties who care about the idea that pregnant women have become enslaved and want to fix that problem. And I know a lot of Republican women feel very strongly that this is a abhorrent and anti-democratic and disgusting and insulting. I mean, we're spending enormous amounts of money on Ukraine. Well, you know what? Women there have much better rights than women here. You can get an abortion in, in Ukraine. And so why are we trying to help them improve their democracy? I mean, I, it's not that they don't need our help. I'm just saying we, we are running around the world saying we need to help other countries become more democratic. We're not helping our own country be more democratic. We are undermining democracy, enslaving women in the year 2022. How is that possible? Joe Biden can fix the Dobbs decision, restore Roe versus Wade, put women in the constitution where they belong alongside men, equally alongside men with full equal protection rights, full due process rights, unmitigated equality for the first time in history is a phone call away. Joe Biden can pick up the phone, tell the archivist to put the ERA in the constitution, reboot the constitution, give us an opportunity to argue that the Dobbs decision is void because it was decided under a different constitution where women weren't present. And now we are. That's how simple this issue is to fix. And all mainstream media won't tell this story. No means, no mainstream media has even mentioned the way the ERA fixes Dobbs or the fact that Joe Biden is blocking. No mainstream media has written about this. Why? Why is that? And what can we do to rise up as people in a democracy where rising up is deeply democratic, right? It's what we ought to do. And we should do it in a nonpartisan way. We should unite the way unions do when something important happens and they need to fix it. You come together fiercely. You say to the Democratic Party, we will not vote for you in November unless you publish the ERA in the Constitution. We, women from all parties, will vote for Alice Paul, who's long dead, but she was a fantastic ERA activist. We will vote for Alice Paul rather than any Democrat or any Republican because a dead feminist is more valuable to women than a living male supremacist. That's how bad things have gotten for women in America. We'd rather vote for a dead feminist. Well, we have the leverage now to be able to say to both parties, what are you gonna do for us? Don't tell us what you think you can do. Oh, I'm gonna codify Roe, I'm gonna ban abortion. Don't tell us what you're gonna do for us. We will tell you what you need to do for us if you want our vote. That's the American way. 
That's what I'm hoping you can help with. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. Power to the people. It's Naomi Wolf of Daily Clout, and I am asking you to please, uh, if you like the video you just saw, uh, support us, become a member, donate. Um, you can send checks to P.O. Box 24, Millerton, New York, 12546, or go to Daily Clout, D-A-I-L-Y-C-L-O-U-T, become a member or donate. Thank you so much for your support. Every penny goes for paying our hardworking staff, paying hosting costs, and paying our lawyers um, who have been uh, leading the fight to keep you safe and free to keep the Constitution safe and to keep you free. Thank you so much.